So I'm going to preach a message today called Certain or Uncertain. Let's, let's begin in the Word of God. Today I'm going to begin in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to begin with, um, we're going to do it in the New Living Translation today. Because I just want you to see some things that I, I don't have time to break down and define all the terms that are maybe mentioned in the King James. Uh, fierce, heady, high-minded, incontinent, all those sort of things. And I'm not here to insult anyone's intelligence. But the New Living Translation, I think, puts it in very, very simple and, and, and easier terms to be able to grasp real quickly. So, the message is called certain or uncertain. Which one are you or which one do you choose? So let's go. Let's, let's start in the Word of God. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, y'all wake, say amen. Anybody want some chicken? Say amen. amen. Anybody want grilled hamburger? Say amen. amen. All right, so I'll try to preach fast and get you to that if you'll work with me. And I'll preach faster if I can hear you say amen. But if I have to feel like I'm digging a well that's 10,000 feet deep to get an amen, y'all know we'll be here all day, okay? So can I hear an amen? amen. All right, let's, there we go. I heard a little bit, little bit stronger there. There we go. The Bible says, you shall know this, Timothy, that in the last days, mark that right there in your Bible. You might want to mark that. Last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents. Man, we've been in the last days a long time. No, I'm just kidding. Disobedient to parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like this. Then I want you to go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the last days. You might want to mark that last days again. In the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Somebody say amen. This sounds a whole lot better than the first one, doesn't it? Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. That means they'll talk for God. They'll say what God is saying. They'll speak what God is speaking. Your men, uh, will, your young men will see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maid servants, or men servants and maid servants, will I pour out my spirit in those, day, of those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth beneath blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, will you stretch your hand this way and pray for me and I want to pray for you and let's, uh, let's see what the Lord has to say today, okay? Father, I love you so much. I thank you for the people of God that are here. Lord, I receive the prayers uh, and, and what you're going to do as a result of the prayers the people are praying, but also pray for us all and, and them, Lord, that you'd give us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to perceive what you're trying to say. We're listening. We say it like Samuel of old, speak for your servants are listening. Here, speak to our hearts and forever change our lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So here's what you see, that both of these two, by the unction of the Holy Spirit, Timothy and Peter, uh, speak two things. Actually, it's Paul writing to Timothy, and it's Luke writing the book of Acts. But I'm going to use Timothy, and I'm going to use Peter, because this, the book title is Timothy, and Peter's the one speaking, Luke just recorded it. But, but, but here's, here's the two things that you see, you see two different operations of the same time period. Both of them are considered the last days. How many of you know that we're in the last days? And if you, if you don't know that, let me just give you a little bit of uh, uh, news flash. 
uh, Skippy, we're in the last days. And uh, th- we're in the last of the last days. And, and, and here's, here's what we see. We see an a operation, a worldly function that looks like turmoil and chaos. We see Paul saying to Timothy that in the last days, there's going to be very, very tough times. Now, if we look at our day, and I think every probably generation has done this since the writing of the Scripture, but if we look at our context and we look at our day and time, I I have to say to you, and I think it would be easy for us all to kind of maybe summarize that, man, we probably are living in the last of the last days. Now, again, while every generation has probably seen some form or measure of this, I mean, in other words, you know, I don't think that in first generation a Christian family that you had every kid obeying their parents. That should make for some of us to feel a whole lot better about some of our kids maybe. I don't know. Uh, but, but I believe that you, I can find you scriptural examples where the kids didn't always obey their parents. But what this scripture is talking about is how much more it will be prevalent in the last days. There, there always have been people that love pleasures more than they love God. Just look at the heathen nations of the Old Testament. There's, that has always been, but the overlying, arching, reaching circumference of the globe would be that, that in the last days that these things would be even greater. And so, and so we find that we have this one side that things are in chaos and turmoil and all kinds of ungodliness go on. But then we see this other side of the last days. And I believe this is, this is the kingdom view and I believe this is what God is wanting to do and this is, this is the prophetic of what God is saying about our day and time. He, it's, it's not as though he's negating the fact that there's negativities going on. He just says, even in the midst of that, in the last days as well, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And I say amen to that. I wish I would have coined this phrase. I didn't. It was uh, Pastor Jim Raley who did it at Calvary Christian Center in Ormond Beach, Florida. But, 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 uh, but he, he says the revenge of, the, of this, this past season of chaos will be revival of the church. And now I, I, I tend to grasp that a whole lot. And I'll hopefully explain to you why as I move throughout this message. But, but, but I believe that the revenge of the kingdom is revival. And and its revival looks like God pouring out His Spirit on those who would willingly then respond to that outpouring and then rise up with a prophetic voice to say what God's saying, do what God's doing, respond what God is wanting us to respond to, and, 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 and serve like God is saying. So do you see that with me? We see the, the, these two things that's unfolding in the last day. Well, I want to give you four things that that kind of tells me. When I, when I see these things happening, just that statement, the last days, the first thing that it says to me above all other things, even before I try to interpret the, the bad or the outpouring of the Spirit, the one thing that it says to me far above all other things that it could say to me is that Jesus is coming soon. Now, I don't know about you, people don't preach much about Jesus' return anymore. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, when years ago we preach about Jesus' return, I knew it was right to be excited about it. I knew it was right to celebrate it. You know what I mean? I mean, like, people talk about Jesus coming. I'm a Christian, so I don't want Jesus to come, yes. But there was a part of me that because I was young, I wanted to do something with my life. I wanted to, you know, I, I was... A, I was a preacher too, so I wanted to win the world to Jesus. So Jesus, I want you to come, but I want to win the world to you too. So how do I deal with this in my heart? So there was a part of me that would celebrate the fact that I wanted Jesus to come, but there was another part of me that would think, man, I'd like to be able to accomplish this for the Lord. I have to tell you that the more time goes on, now I'm 47 and I still want to accomplish a lot of things for Jesus. I still believe there can be a significant, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, full of the Holy Ghost church in the Tri-Cities, Bristol area, and I believe that could be you and me. I I still believe that as far as one body. Now, I'm not trying to separate us from any other church. I just believe God wants to do something significant through a people that will be yielded to the Holy Spirit and God do something powerful through them. I still believe that. 
But, but at the same time, I sense my heart crying out, Come, Lord Jesus. I sense my heart saying, Lord, I, I want to see you. I, 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 I want to see that today. I, I'd love to be able to see it now. Again, there's part of my heart that says, but my family's not saved, and I want to see my, kid, my, 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 uh, my brothers and, excuse me, my sisters serve God. I want to see them w- walk with God. I want to see them born again. I, I want to see that. But I'll be honest with you, I, I sense my heart wanting to see Jesus. I, I, I sense myself wanting to put my hands in the nail-pierced hands. I, I sense myself wanting to bow down at his feet. I mean, I know I can do it here, and I know he's here by the Spirit, but, but, but I want to just bow down at his feet, kind of like, like the woman the woman who did, uh, you know, Mary, who, who, who just bowed down at his feet. I, I, want, that, I, I want that for my life. I want, I want, to, I want to see that happen. I sense myself when I do funerals anymore, especially for a believer. I kind of sense myself being a little bit envious in my heart. I, 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 I preach their funeral and I think to myself, they are, they are finally beholding what I can only imagine. They, they, they are embracing what I, through the, the, the sense of being in the natural feel limited to sometimes. They, they are seeing what I long to see. They are experiencing what I long to experience. And I find myself at times being a little bit envious of that. And I know that's strange to understand, but the only way I know to explain it was several years ago, one of the things I loved to do was I, I loved the tournament bass fish. Uh, it, um, it, but pre-Jesus, it almost cost me my marriage. That, I just tell you how much I loved it. I, I loved the tournament bass fish. It was fun to me. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I could lose sleep if I got to go fishing. I believe God loves fishing. I do. I, I, I truly believe. Come on now. You know when Jesus, Jesus rose from the dead, one of the times when he seen the disciples, he cooked them a fish breakfast. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he didn't go to the shore and say, Here, kitty, kitty. I mean, he had to fish some way or another. I mean, he, he had some fish prepared for them. And, and, and I believe Jesus, I believe Jesus loves fishing. <laughs> That's just my thought, you know, and I, I, I'll keep that dear to my heart. You, you may think he likes something else, but, but, but I think he likes fishing. And I find myself, you know, I, back then I used to say, I could never imagine myself not doing this. I mean, I, I always told myself, I could can, I can never imagine my life not doing this. Then I got saved. And then I fell in love with Jesus. And, I, and, and he called me into ministry and I started doing ministry. And it wasn't as though I didn't love fishing anymore. It's just that I loved Jesus more. Somehow, somehow this thing that I thought I couldn't live without, something else took over the affection of my heart. That's kind of how I feel about the return of Jesus right now. There's an affection that's taken over my heart that says, just any moment now, I'm going to see the Lord. Does anybody still believe in the return of Jesus? Does anybody still believe that Jesus says he's coming again and that he will fulfill that promise? You know, one of the marks of the last days of the people will begin to say, well, where is he at? Show us the sign of his coming. People kind of get put out with the whole Jesus returning thing. You know, I recognize maybe one of the reasons why people maybe got maybe put out on Jesus' return, is that when you always preach about Jesus' return and you also had to preach about, well, when Jesus returned, you better be right. Because if you weren't right with God, guess where you get to go? You get to go see the boogeyman. People had to preach about hell and judgment. And now in our society, we don't get to talk about that. In fact, we've dubbed preachers that preach about stuff like that as hell, fire, brimstone preachers, right? And, and you know what? That's, that's not a positive connotation. If, 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 you're in, you know, if you're inviting people to church and if they ask you, well, how's your preacher? How does the preacher preach? They'll all, you know, likely tag it with, I hope he's not one of those hellfire brimstone preachers. And I get it. I understand you can't preach judgment every week. The Bible doesn't talk about hell all the time. Talks about the love of God, the goodness of God, the blessings of God. Talks about angels, the Holy Spirit. Talks about a lot of things. So you got to preach the whole counsel of God. I get it. 
But people don't want to talk about the fact that if Jesus comes, there's going to be people that's left behind. They don't get to go with him. And quite possibly, quite possibly, they could be judged for all eternity. So, so when you have to preach on that, people don't like to hear that. But my heart it gets excited about the fact that Jesus could be coming at any moment. That any moment now, I, I could see the Lord. And for some people, that creates problems. For some people, that creates trepidation. But for me, it's expectation. And so the Bible says in Luke 21, 28, Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws nigh. So, so the Bible says to his ministers, look for him. Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? I, I'm looking for Jesus to return. And I don't want to get too many amens of looking for Jesus to return, but, but, but the reality of it is, is that my heart, it's kind of like the, it's kind of like, uh, the, the bride. It's been separated from the groom a, 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 for a long period of time. Let me tell you something. I love my wife dearly. We've been married now 20 some years, seven, seven, 27 years. And here's one thing that I've noticed. If I go on a long trip, whether if, if I'm preaching somewhere else, overseas, if I'm gone for a long period of time, when I come back, she's like extra sweet. She's all ripped. She, she's sweet to me anyway, but when I come back off of a long trip, it's like she's extra, extra sweet. Makes me want to go on trips all the time. But, <laughs> but she's, really, she's really sweet to me. And I guess I am to her too. I, I missed her. I, there was, it was great ministry, but I couldn't wait to get home and talk to her again and hold her again. There's something in my heart saying, I, I love the Lord and we've been kind of away for a long time and I, I want to see him. I just want to see the Lord. Se second thing that I see, second thing in this is, you have to grab this a little bit. It's, it's the fact that in this, in this time, we, we need to decide whether we are certain or we're not certain of our walk with God, certain or not certain about the times with which we live in. There's some people, I hear it all the time, we live in uncertain times. No, I, I, I beg to differ. I think we live in very certain times. I believe that we live in so certain times that I believe I can find the news media, the news, the modern day news headline in the Word of God. And it's extremely important for us to be very certain, very certain about who we are and where we're walking with God. So, here's what, and, and I recognize, look, look, I know that when I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, sometimes we can insert ourselves at least in places. Like we could insert, insert ourselves as that maybe we're not uh, proud or boastful or, you know, we're, we're not heady, high-minded, something, something like that. So, so let's look at it. You know, we, we can say, well, we're not, we're not reckless. We're not puffed up with pride. We don't, we don't love pleasures more than we love God. Well, let's dissect that for just a little bit. Is that really true? It begins by saying people love themselves and their money. Now, let's be honest with you, with one another. I have been in a position in my life where I didn't have two nickels to rub together. And I've been where I had a little money in my pocket. I'm going to tell you, it's easier to be happy with a little money in your pocket. Let's just be honest, right? I mean, I know we're in a church and everybody can give me the religious response. But the truth is, there was a time that this lady and I had to live paycheck to paycheck. You know what paycheck to or People used to say hand to mouth. Had to live hand to mouth. I mean, you work with your hand, you put it in your mouth, and it's gone. Just that fast. Um, there are times that there, there were times in our life that we've had to live just like that. And I always liked it at paycheck. But I remember at times if I missed a day of work, 
that was drastic. Might not be able to pay the bills. If I miss a day of work, I couldn't be out sick. I don't have time to be sick. If I'm out sick, then we're not going to be able to pay something, and that ain't good. Thank God for Dave Ramsey. <laughs> Thank God that I learned some principles from Dave Ramsey. Praise the Lord. Thank God, and, and what he teaches is biblical principles, so thank God for God. <laughs> thank God for tithing. I mean, who would have known that if you just tithe, God would just say, I can bless that. If you just be faithful in tithing, then I can bless that, and I'll show you what I can do. That, that really relieved my heart. Another thing, it, it, the blessing of God, so thankful for the Lord. Because the Lord showed me some things about investing. Not just investing, but planting seed. The Lord has taught us something about planting seed. I mean, you, you, God, God is so amazing. You can bless somebody, and before you turn around, God's brought it back into your life in ways that you couldn't imagine. I mean, maybe you don't know what this is like, but, but maybe you do. Maybe you don't know exactly what it's like, but it's, it's really awesome to to maybe be in, a, be in a line somewhere or you be in a restaurant somewhere and you want to bless somebody and you just say, I'm, I'm going to buy that person's meal right over there. And, and that waitress gets to, somebody took care of your meal uh, today or somebody behind you in line in, 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 in fast food or something like that. And you just decide, I don't know who this is behind me, but today I'm going to bless them. I'm going to bless them because I believe in sowing seed. And the Lord is amazing like that. Like when he sees you do stuff like that, he bless your life. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that now, you know, maybe if I didn't get paid next week, it wouldn't be as drastic. We wouldn't lose our mortgage, okay? One reason the house is paid for. Praise God. Whew, hallelujah. Now, don't judge me. I built my own house, so I got it a little cheaper uh, than, than, than a lot of people maybe would. But, but the, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't lose everything tomorrow if I wasn't, if I wasn't paid today. Thank the Lord for that. Now, I couldn't go too long without that. But, but, but the truth is, is that I like getting paid, and we all like getting paid. But, but if that we, our focus is shifted to ourselves and the love of money, quite possibly we could be functioning in a different system called Timothy's system. Not Timmy, but, but Timothy's system. Timothy system where, where according to God, God says there's a problem with the world in its last day is that people don't think of others. They think of themselves first, take care of themselves always first. And God says in my kingdom, you, you prefer others before yourself. And so while we may look and say, well, we're not a part of Timothy's system. If we're not careful, we might actually be. Now, I'm preaching to some people that in my heart, I just believe that the majority of you are right with God and you're on your way to heaven. I just believe that. Did you know I read an article one time that really shocked me? Here's what the article said. I don't even remember where I... Maybe it was on a Barner Research article or something or another like that. And I don't even know who wrote it. I don't even know if it was George Barner. I'm, I'm, I might not should blame that on him. But, but it was, the article said this. Most pastors believe that 90 to 100% of their people are actually saved and love God. When in reality, studies find that 50% or less actually do. And I'm thinking, whoa. Now, I don't know who wrote that article. I don't know who said that, so I can't, you know, I can't make you be mad at them. But, but if that were to be true, what is the criteria that it was based upon? And I don't know. Maybe it's something like this, where God shows that in the last days, people are so invested in themselves and in money and pleasures rather than the things of God, that, and, and, and God says to his people, from this turn away, from such people turn away. Now, I'm not talking about turn away so as they go to hell. I'm talking about so that they don't have the influence in your life. The influence in your life of just putting yourself first. See, you can never see how good God can come through until you put somebody else ahead of yourself. You know, the motto around is take, you got to take care of number one because nobody else will. Yeah, they will. If you're a child of God, I know whose responsibility that is. It belongs to God. 
You're, you're the sheep of his pasture. He had told us before, he said, listen, consider the lilies of the field. They don't toil, they don't spin. Consider the birds of the air, they don't plant, they don't sow, but God takes care of them. And how much more are you better than they? And God said, I'll take care of you. But what you got to do is function in his system. And to function in his system, the best way to know that is he's given a prescription of what the world system looks like in 2 Timothy chapter 3, is don't function like that. Don't operate like that. And he says, Here, here's what they do. They, 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 they are proud. They're boastful. They scoff at God. They're disobedient to parents. Uh, man, that could be bad, right? Like, disobedient to parents. Uh, they, they will slander others and have no self-control. It doesn't mean that they can't control themselves. It means that they refuse to. It means if it feels good, they do it. It means if it makes them mad, they'll, they'll, they, they just cast off restraint. But here's what God says. He says, and this, this is in Peter's deal here. He's preaching. He says, but in the last days, God's going to pour out His Spirit. I want to be a part of that right there. I want to be a part of where God is pouring out His Spirit. I want to function in the kingdom, and I believe you do too. I believe the Lord wants us to function in His kingdom and manifest the glory of the Lord. I believe that's why the Lord has been putting on our hearts for, for now six months to really preach on what God wants to do in this last day, in this last hour with this church, and in this moment, in this time. I believe that's with all of my heart the reason He gave me Isaiah 61 and 2 is that I believe He's wanting our church, our family, us, you, me, to function in the kingdom like we're supposed to and advance the kingdom like we're supposed to. I believe God is calling on us to do that. I believe we're, and we're, God is screaming from heaven saying, listen, revival that you've wanted has never stopped. It's just you stopped functioning in it. It's part of the last days. Remember the last days started when Peter preached this message. He, it started when he preached this message. And he said, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. The problem is, is that God hasn't stopped pouring out his spirit. We've just stopped desiring him pouring out his spirit. We've stopped desiring getting under where his glory is coming. We've stopped desiring the things of God. We wanted church more than we wanted glory. We, wanted the, we, we, we just wanted to be, we wanted our spiritual ears tickled and scratched more than we wanted the glory and the kingdom to advance. And so God says, God's been screaming to us, arise, shine, arise, shine. Well, that'd be great, but, but, but don't we have to pray for revival for two years before we get the Brownsville experience? I've heard it all, in all my Christian life. You've got to pay the price for what God wants to do. I get that to a point, but there's another point that helps me to think, Maybe Jesus already paid the price. And because he paid the price, maybe that's why Acts 2 is the way that it is. Is that there, there come a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And, I, and again, I get the paying the price as far as going after what God wants to do. But, but, but I am of the opinion that God is doing it. What if revival is now? What if God wants to do something now and we keep limiting him because we, we say we can't. It's pandemic time. We can't do anything right now. We can't, we, we can't flow. We can't prophesy right now because right now we're in racial tension and economic stress. We can't do that right now. now I believe God's saying, no, listen, every time God ever done something great, it was in the midst of the worst chaotic times of history. Every time it got bad, God raised up a judge. Every time it got tough, God would raise up a deliverer. Every time things got bad in the world, God called on his people to shine. God called on his people to prophesy. God called on his people to stand up. I believe the Lord's saying to us, stand up, the time is now. Not when it gets back to normal and we feel good, the time is now. So let me read that Isaiah scripture just a little bit for you, but I'm going to take it a little farther. Heretofore, I've spent six months, six months by the leading of the Holy Spirit to preach on verses 1 and 2. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, 
Darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. Here's why. Here's why. Here's what it looks like. Look at the next verse. The Gentiles shall come to your light. The kings to the brightness of your rising. Do you, know, do you, do you hear what that is saying? Do you understand? So, so that's an Old Testament scripture. It has a prophetic futuristic meaning. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, in fact, this, I think this is revival in and of itself. He's saying, so in this Old Testament, let me back up. In this Old Testament context, the word Gentiles are all the other nations beside the Jews, besides God's people. Doesn't matter if they're Amorites, doesn't matter if they're Philistines, it doesn't matter what nation they came from, doesn't matter if they're Egyptians, Medes, Parthians, it doesn't matter. In all the other nations of the world, God says they're, they're, they are categorized as Gentiles. And God says, when my people can actually arise and shine, I will cause all the Gentiles to come. He's, here's what he's saying. When my people know how to arise and shine, Jesus said it, let your light so shine before. He said, when you learn how to do this, I will bring the Gentiles to you. I know how to save them. I know how to fix them. I know how to heal them. I know how to heal this land, but I'm always called on my people. And if my people can arise and shine, I'll show you that I can bring the Gentiles to the house. That's the best evangelistic outreach thing. Listen, we have tried biker bashes. We have tried, we, 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 you name it. I'm telling you, we have tried it all. We've tried everything that we could possibly think of to win our community to Jesus. And, and at least since I've been the pastor, yeah, we, we've come a long ways. We've come from that few little eight people over at Norfolk Avenue to what God has given us now. We've come a long ways, but I'm telling you, it's a far cry from what I believe God wants to do. I believe the Lord wants to do so much more than that. But I believe God spent 18 years telling me, yes, you can have biker basses, and yes, you can do parties in the parking lots, and you can do outreaches in the town but if you'll ever get to where the glory can shine upon you I'll show you what I can do yes that'll reap something because the gospel will reap something but I'll show you how I can bring the Gentiles if I can get the glory upon you and you know what there's something in my heart saying do it God do it I feel like the Lord is saying through the messages that we just preached get where you can see get where you can hear Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Get united. Get the kingdom manifesting and advancing forward. I believe that's God's heart. But listen, let me read the rest of the rest of that passage in Isaiah 60, uh, 1 through 5. Let me read it in its entirety. Arise, shine, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see it. Mm. Oh, get where you can see. You've got to be able to see this. If you see it through the lens of the world, you will see a second Timothy manifestation. But if you can see it through the lens of Acts 2, God says, I'll show you glory. Mm. Oh, lift up your eyes all around and see it. They shall gather together. They shall come to you. Watch this. Your son shall come from afar and your daughters to be nursed at your side. Do you hear me? Somebody that's got wayward children ought to shout, ought to give God praise right there because they're not hopelessly lost. I don't care how dark of a place they're in. I don't care how many drugs they've done and I don't care how many relationships they're in and I don't care what the devil has done to wreak havoc. God says if you'll just get the glory, if you'll let the glory rise up on you, did I not promise you that if you'll arise and shine, I can bring them, I can bring unbelievers, but I'm not going to leave out your kids and your grandkids. I'm going to bring them... Your, it, do you understand what that means is that your daughter's nursing at your side? It's not talking about they'll become little babies again, but they'll just come to the place where they understand that I really do need my mom. I really do need my mom's God. I really do need my mom's Holy Ghost. I really do need my mama's word. I really do need what God has given me through my mom and dad through the rest of my life. Come on, somebody. Woo, I feel the Lord. Woo. I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord. <laughs> Mm -mm -mm. He said, he said your, son, your, nurse, your daughters shall come and be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. Oh, he said, now you're going to shine, but you're gonna, I'm going to take this up a level. How many know you can become radiant when your babies are getting saved? 
Come on, it's good to worship God when he's moving like he is. But when you look down the aisle and see your kids that had lost their mind at one time, went crazy in this world, and the devil thought he had a hold of them, but you look down and you see their hands lifted before. That does something to you as a parent. When you look over and you see your babies with their hands lifted toward God, you know they're calling on the Lord. Something runs right through you as a parent. And all of a sudden, that glow that you had from just the Holy Ghost coming on you feels a little bit radiant. It feels a little bit stronger because of God's goodness that he's shown up on you. Oh, come on, somebody. Woo. He said, you shall become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy. Yes, sir, that's what I'm talking about right there. Your heart will swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Mm. How many you know there's no shortage of finances in revival. Come on, somebody. So we've been preaching about if God's called us to arise and shine, what does that look like? He says, get where you can see, get where you can hear. Get filled with the Spirit, get united, and get the kingdom advancing forward for the time is now. Now listen to me before we close. These are not uncertain times. These are very certain and strategic times. The real question or the real statement should be, what are you doing or what are you a part of in this very certain time? Are you a part of the kingdom? That where the spirit is being poured out and the glory is being seen? Are you a part of the kingdom that is cursing at God, that is violent, fierce it's lost its way I don't know where you are you'll walk with God but I beg you yeah I beg you some preachers say I'm not going to beg you I beg you I come down I would promise you I would crawl off of this stage on my knees walk on my knees all the way back where you are with tears in my eyes if I thought it would make a difference Rod Parsley used to tell a story. Go ahead and stand with me. Rod Parsley used to tell a story several years ago. He talked about a notorious criminal in England called Mr. Pease. I never met the man. I don't know the man. And I haven't done a study. I'm just going to cite a preacher. Hopefully he done his. Mr. Pease was a notorious criminal who had murdered and raped all over England, was put into prison and facing death. A priest was called for him to come and talk to him. The priest comes in to talk to Mr. Pease. Mr. Pease stood up, told that preacher to hush his mouth. Shocked. The preacher said, don't you know who I am? Mr. Peace said, I don't care who you are. You're nothing to me. He said, because if you was a real man of God, and if that book you carried is actually true, though the road be paved from, and he named two cities that was like 150 miles apart. He said, though these, the road be paved with broken and jagged glass, Upon my knees and hands would I crawl until they become bloody stumps if that one person would hear the gospel that you say is true. Shamed, the preacher bowed his head and walked out. Here's, here's the moral of the story. The criminal was basically saying, if you really believe this gospel is true, then it's worth all costs to get it out. No matter what. And I say, ouch. Honestly, I say, ouch. Because I live in a country that's still free to worship and yet sometimes find excuses not to do so. I live in a country where the Bible is free to be able to pick up and read it any time that I want to and still fail to do so at times. 
I live in a country where I can tell somebody else about the gospel of Jesus Christ and still fail to do so at times. So I say, ouch. But I also say, Lord, arise, shine. Teach me how to do so. Help me to be fearless. Help me to be brave. Help me to be bold. Help me to be anointed and be filled because the gospel work must go on. So we live in very certain times. The question would be, are you certain of the times with which you live? 